Thomas Triber. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived for Inside Boxing Weekly. So here are your hosts, Mike Goodpaster, John Einreinhofer, and Jeremiah Pricer on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Weekly is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Make sure you go to MyBookie.ag, use the promo code TGT100 to get up to 100% bonus on your first $300, up to $300 deposit. Or you can go to thegruelingtruth.com, click the MyBookie banner at the top of the page. Also, we are brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation, Alex Ramos, Jackie Richardson. Make sure you check them out on Facebook. I am your co-host for Inside Boxing Weekly, Mike Goodpaster. And right now, I want to welcome in my co-host, first up. Jeremiah Pricer. What's up, man? I'm excited to be here. Let's talk some boxing, dude. All right. And next up, John Einreinhofer. Hey, how you doing, John? <laughs> Mike, my, my, good, good to be there. Got, glad you got your J's straight there. Well, I did. After a while and after constant thought. Um, Canelo fought Jacobs. What do you think? I mean, the decision, we all said that Jacobs couldn't win a decision, John. And we were right, but Canelo deserved to win the fight. I thought the fight was closer to what it needed to be. There was a lot of really close rounds. I wish Canelo would have done a little bit more to make this a more decisive win. But overall, I think there's no doubt, unless you're an idiot, Canelo won the fight. Surprisingly, kind of see it the same way, Mike. I thought, you know, Canelo pretty... Close rounds, I agree, but, you know, I thought Canelo pretty much controlled everything in the first half, and it wasn't that he wasn't in control in the second half, but I agree with you, actually. Didn't didn't quite – did some of that Canelo stuff he does once in a while, even as good as he is. You know, he, he's not a, he's not a ferocious finisher by any means and uh, didn't, didn't, didn't step it up to that type of level. You know, almost let Jacobs get back into it, but – then to me he was he was still able to close it strong enough, but uh, you know wasn't any really really decisive uh, decisive action there. You know I think Can- Canelo validated that you know him and Golovkin have the two best chins out there because we know Jacobs can punch and you know I thought Jacobs fought in a similar fashion to the Golovkin fight. Uh, Canelo was able to use his head movement to get close and not to stay out on the on the outside but he had a couple of moments here and there where he laid back a little bit and that's that part where you you know you just don't see him step stepping up forward really trying to you know get somebody out of there uh, unless he's really pressed and you know I thought Canelo clearly won it wasn't a bad fight but wasn't anything that we're going to be talking about for years which makes it a bad fight John because we need something to talk about for years because we don't get it very often and well I agree we uh, do need that and the thing that stares out to me, Jeremiah, is still this. Whether it's Floyd Mayweather, Canelo Alvarez, Danny Jacobs, it seems like most guys today are just in this to do just enough to win the fight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I pretty much said the same thing not long ago on social media. It's just one of those things, man. It's, it's like these guys, they know they're collecting a big check, and they can just, you know, kind of like you said, they can put it on cruise control, and do just enough to win or lose. But you don't really see that fire there, you know? It's like, we're talking about this. I mean, tons of people were talking about this, you know, beforehand. And some people thought Danny Jacobs was talented enough to beat Canelo Alvarez. And I still think that might be the case. I mean, he looks, he's got good hand speed. He's got big power. He just doesn't move his hands enough. And, you know, John, to your credit, you called that uh, on our weekly show, you know, before the fight even happened. You're like, hey, I, I just... I noticed that he doesn't move his hands that much, and it might, you know, could turn out to hurt him. And, and it, it's become a recurring theme now. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. Like he's very good, but he's not quite good enough to beat the very best in the division. You know, and I don't think moving up to one six is really going to, you know, change that. And my concern was why he he threw away one million dollars. <laughs> you know, blowing through the blow, blowing through the weight check, only to not use the weight as an advantage. All right. I, I mean, he was clearly the bigger guy. Uh, you know, he, he really, I mean, there were, after about the first six rounds, I mean, even sporadically there, he would press Canelo, you know, he would let his hands go a little bit. But 
again, it's, 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 it's in spurts. He's not consistent with his work. He seemed unsure of himself, and, you know, that's really to Canelo's credit because his head movement was so damn good. I mean, he's just a really hard guy to catch cleanly. I mean, even in that big shot where he landed that uh, thing from the southpaw position where he landed that big left hand uh, that a lot of us were raving about initially, if you watch the replay, you know, Canelo's pretty good at taking some of the steam off that stuff, but it was just a disappointing effort from Jacobs mostly because we all knew that Jacobs had to go out there and get it, but he didn't. I mean, even at distance, his jab was just ineffective. So, uh, yeah, I, it turned out to be uh, a bad perform. I don't want to say a bad performance. I mean, you know, it's not like Jacobs just came and lo- you know laid down or anything. But again, he just didn't go out and get it. He wasn't impressive. And uh, you know, to Canelo's credit, I don't even know if he was. I mean, he didn't really stun Jacobs. So uh, I don't know. He just didn't seem like he really needed to push on the gas either. And it sucked to see these guys go 12 rounds. I mean, you'd like to see him a little back and forth there and see some exchanges. But, you know, Canelo just kind of is what he is. He boxed like John said he might, you know, before the before the fight happened. And I don't know, man. It just wasn't that impressive. I can't say it was a bad fight, though. I mean, they, too, they are two highly skilled guys. And it's always nice to see guys who are in the top five at least go at it. And I thought maybe there was, uh, you know, an argument that Jacobs was the second best middleweight in the world, you know, based on his performance mm-hmm. over Golovkin. But now, but now I just think that he's clearly third, you know. Even now, you know, I'd, I'd still wonder what he'd be like against a guy like Saunders or even Charlo, uh, you know, or Hurd. So it, it's becoming a loaded division, but it was all right. Well, my prevailing thought is this, John. If this would have been Gennady Golovkin, we'd have seen a lot better fight. And what is next? Does he fight Golovkin next? Because I hear a lot of talk about Demetrius Andrada and Callum Smith. Well, you guys might be surprised at this, but even though I would still pick Canelo in a third fight, I thought there were some, even despite Golovkin's age, I thought there were some things in this fight that he could feel good about about, that I might not have thought going in where I think – even at his age, I think the third fight, I still pick Canelo, but I think it's going to maybe be more competitive than I thought it would be. And I think Golovkin will still box some, but, you know, Canelo has a bit of that cautiousness in that we're talking about. And I think I actually, I actually like this new mean Golovkin. <laughs> I thought it was actually amusing after the fight when Golovkin now in Russia to say, these guys, these guys didn't impress me. This was a dull fight. Uh, I, I didn't see much more than a sparring session out there. I actually found that amusing. So I, I'm still in the camp. I know all of us are on this one, but oddly enough, at, at a hardcore people, somehow we seem to be becoming the minority that want this third fight. I'm not – I don't feel like I'm paying for my disown for uh, Canelo and – Andrade. No, Andrade's not uh, done Andrade, anything. What has Andrade even done to get this shot over Golovkin? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Canelo's the lineal middleweight champ. I mean, you know, you know, Andre, Andre, he's a, I mean, he's a legit top ten guy, but yeah, he hasn't really beaten anybody particularly of note. I watched and, him go uh, life and death with Jack Cole Yeah, I, I don't, I don't need, I, you know, if, if the zones offering this yearly pass i'm not i know we're in boxing and i knew i might not get it but i'm i'm as a yearly pass subscriber now saying i want canelo triple g3 in my yearly pass in the fall and if i don't get it i'm not going to be happy with it so um and i I think it does come down to that because they don't have that much to offer frankly um so they, they, they should get that. I think there were signs from what we saw Saturday night. It might be – I still pick Canelo clearly, but I think it might be more comp- – I mean, it, you know, it, and obviously the first two fights were razor close. I mean – Hey, John, you know, John, real yeah. quick, how about this? I think I want to see it again because I think Triple G is going to be even less. But the thing about Triple G is he will force Canelo to fight. Can, Canelo fight – Canelo – yeah, you know the funny thing is Canelo. Canelo is almost the opposite of most fighters. Yeah, when when Canelo when Canelo gets pressed by a guy he thinks might hurt him, is when he gets more ferocious. So, 
uh, that's something that I, that that is right. You know, Golovkin can hurt you. So I mean, even though Canelo's got a great chin, Golovkin's got a great chin. So yeah, Canelo's going to have to you know have to fight in that sense. I want to see it again. I don't know where I, I don't know where people are coming from. I really don't. So uh, I want to see it again. I think that would be horrible for DAZN. Um if we don't get it again. I mean, I don't think again, you know, interpretations of it. And I think people are changing the target. The DAZN numbers, you know, we're not we're not good. Six hundred thousand concurrent U.S. streams for Canelo Jacobs, which. I'm, I'm saying this because it wasn't anybody on this show that said it, but on Twitter, other social media, people uh, saying it was preposterous to think that Beter Biev would would beat that on ESPN. Well, guess what? Beter Biev peaked at peaked at 625,000, and DAZN peaked with concurrent streams. In other words, that means they're they're counting two streams that could have been coming from the same house at 600,000. So yeah, it was razor close, but. They actually got beaten by Peter Biev against Kalajic. So don't tell me that that's what they were looking for with all this hype. I don't think anybody can honestly in their heart believe that. I'm so sh- I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just making I'm sure they were that- looking for it. <laughs> I think they're happy with that. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, Andrade, Callum Smith, neither one excite me. They excite me more than Rocky Fielding. But if you can right. give me, to me, the two best middleweights in the world, no matter who you think's one or who who you think's two, the top two are still Canelo and Triple G. Am I wrong here, Jeremiah? No, no. Again, I, I think Jacobs made that clear. I mean, he's just a guy who doesn't do quite enough, and it, it's unfortunate, man, because I really do think he has the talent to potentially beat anybody. I mean, like I said, he's got good hand speed, he's got good size, he's got real good power. He just doesn't put it away. He, just, he doesn't put it together well enough. Again, he just doesn't move his hand. But speaking of moving his hand, uh, you know this whole uh, you know Golov could now work with Jonathan Banks thing. I mean, it was kind of out of the left field for all of us. You know, we were like, well, you know, who on the West Coast would be a good style fit here? You know, a lot of us were like, oh well, Robert Garcia makes some sense. I mean, he's uh, he's a good teacher of the jab, and uh, you know he deals with a lot of aggressors, so that would make some sense. Uh, you know, and there were a few other names tossed around too. And then he picks Jonathan Banks. And, you know, I thought Jonathan Banks did just about nothing in, in Vladimir Klitschko's corner. And so, again, it seems a bit confusing. But one thing, to my point, that I heard Jonathan Banks say was that he wants to see Gennady Golovkin move his hands more. And I was like, okay, well, it, at least he's got that right. I mean, if there's something against Canelo Alvarez would like to see more in Golovkin – it's moving his hands. I mean, he was, you know, very consistent with his jab. He always is. In fact, I think he threw over 800 punches in the rematch, which statistically is good. It, it is a high output for a middleweight, but by and large, you know, a lot of those are jabs, right? I mean, he's, he's all the dead spaces. He's just keeping his left hand moving. And if he wants to win, with, uh, which I'm in the camp with you guys, I don't think he's going to win. And, um, uh, you know, but he, he's got to move his hands more, his power shots. I, I, again, I think he's, a, a, you know, a bit faded. His timing isn't as good as he was. You know, Canelo can do that to you because his defense is so good. You get unsure of yourself, right? So you don't know what quite to do. You're, you're constantly guessing. But just throwing is sometimes good enough. You know what I mean? And I think John said something that was interesting, too, and I want to touch on that. And, and of course, it play, ties into all this, where – I, I was, I, I know I talked to you off air, Mike, you know, thinking, may, I, you know, maybe Golovkin gets stopped in the third fight. I mean, he's a real tough guy, but, you know, he's on the plus side of 37 now. You know, he's had almost 400 fights in his career total. And, uh, again, I was kind of leaning towards maybe a, maybe a stoppage. for Not Canelo, after seeing but, this, though. What? Yeah, after seeing that, I think Golovkin can do enough to, you know. Uh, It'll be a close boost, fight again. <laughs> No, that's where well, I've made I, the change. That's where I've made the change too. Is I, I, I going in? I would have thought just what you thought, Jeremiah. That Canelo will pick it up in the third fight. Got a real good chance to stop him. I didn't see that Saturday night from Canelo, and that to me at least opens the door for Golovkin a tiny bit. Well, how about this? Yeah, I, I complete. Oscar De La Hoya says he's interested in matching Canelo Alvarez with Errol Spence. I think he's full of shit. Yeah, I, what do you guys think? Well, believe no, it or not, I. You know, it doesn't fit. 
right now with the promotional things, but I'll tell you what, when he said it, and then I started thinking about it over a couple more days, and, you know, Oscar will just start saying stuff, but I mean, like, there might be something where he's really thinking it. Like, and I think it's this. We didn't know the DAZN, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold firm to this because it's what I believe. You know, you can try to put rosy spins on it all you want, but reality is reality. Oscar might have had wind of those numbers <laughs> or what they were going to be before we just got them a couple hours ago. And, you know, look, as big of a star as Canelo is, if he keeps getting seen in the U.S. by those small numbers of people, time, you know, you can get a buy with it one time or on a pay-per-view when you're charging 100 bucks, but he can't afford, even Canelo Alvarez can't afford in the U.S. a bunch of DAZN outings. Like, like you said, Mike, if he fights Ken, Callum Smith next or Andre, now we know how low those fights are going to draw on DAZN. So here's what I'm thinking. Errol Spence is going to fight Sean Porter and Fox on August 3rd. He just had a successful pay-per-view. He's already been seen by 6.3 million after the U.S. Olympic basketball. Yeah, they're putting that on regular <laughs> Fox, correct? Yes. Oh, that so, right there is huge. Right. So you're talking millions are going to see him. All of a sudden, if you're Oscar De La Hoya and, and Canelo, which I understand that that, that the zone money is not guaranteed, which means I don't know exactly what the contract reads, but you got to think that there's some sort of ouch there. He might say after a while, hey, we're hooking up. We're hooking up with Errol Spence. We're going to make him come up and wait and take the chance, and we're going to get ourselves a big pay per view here. Which, I mean, I, I thought it was the first day. I thought, well, this is just Oscar nonsense. Then I started thinking, but he's talked Kovalev too, and I, I, I just think that that maybe he's looking at it like we are. I mean, they got Golovkin again, and then Callum Smith, Andre. Those aren't drawing any numbers, and and, and the other guys would be worse. You know, if, if it's not the people we're talking about. So I, I don't know where it goes. I mean, they, they may have to, in a, in, you know, it might take a year or two. But, but there Well, if it takes a year or two, to... that would be perfect if you can get Spence in the ring with Crawford. And if Spence, Spence was to beat Crawford, then there's no way you're getting that fight on the zone anyways because they're going to make that pay-per-view no matter what you think. <laughs> right. Well, you, you're yeah, right. Well, yeah. you might not get that. But what you might get is I think you're going to get Spence Porter in August, and then you're going to get Spence against the winner of Thurman Pacquiao. But then maybe you might get Crawford skipped and he goes to Canelo. I mean, uh, just a thought. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, think, no, though, I mean, if, you, if you did that, Jeremiah, and you went Porter, Thurman or Pacquiao, and then next September fought Spence, or fought Crawford, Spence winning those three fights would make him a megastar. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that's, see, it makes sense. When I said I think Oscar's talking shit, I'm talking about in the immediate future. You Me know, too. I think, you know, I think Andrada, uh, you know, Golovkin, Smith, I think those are closer on the radar than Spence is. And I think if Spence is smart, he's probably playing the same game. I mean, we all recognize, and, and we've talked about this a number of times on the show already, that it seems like he's getting Porter and then the winner of Pacquiao Thurman. You know, we all said that's probably the plan. And it would only make sense if afterwards he tried to get Crawford you know, you know, know, soon after that. Because we already know he's going to be a big sell once he beats both of these guys. Porter and Thurman and Pacquiao have all been seen by a lot of people. And, you know, to, to eventually, like, let's say, like you said, he beats Crawford and then, you know, not long after he fights uh, he fights Canelo Alvarez, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's going to do big money. Even if Spence loses, you know, uh, in, a, in a close fight against Crawford, you know, again, you might have a demand for a rematch or something. But as young as Thurman and Spence are, I mean, sorry, as, as young as Canelo and Spence are, I wouldn't be surprised to see that within the next two, three years. That would make some sense, and I wouldn't mind seeing it because Spence has been, a, he's a big welterweight anyway, so yeah. he can move up and, and you know, just to the class in, in little time, in my opinion. All right, next up, what do we got this weekend? I'm sure we got some classic fights. We've, or wait, we forgot Peter Biev. What, what was you guys' take on Peter Biev, Jeremiah? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't see all that fight. I did see the, I did see the stoppage, and I saw snippets, uh, you know, on the way there. And it looked like Peter Biev looked pretty damn sharp. And I know we had John Stallion, who was in Peter Biev's corner, 
Uh, Peter Beals, he looked, he looked sharp, man. He didn't seem to have as many glaring holes as he had in the past. Of course, that could be, you know, because of his opponent, Kalajic. He chose to box. Uh, and surprisingly, he chose to mix it up with Peter Beals on a number of occasions. But he just seemed like he was a little outgun. His technique wasn't that good. So he was constantly being beat to the punch by Peter Beals. And the stoppage itself, I thought, was a little early. Kalajic looked like he was on his way out, but it, I don't know. I, I just thought it was a little premature. He didn't look like he was in that series of trouble. Uh, so again, it was a good performance by Peter B. I, mean, I, I you know, now I'm looking forward to him, uh, you know, fighting one of the big dogs. And we talked to John Scully on air, and he thinks that you know Sergey Kovalev is going to be next. That's a fight I can look forward to. I really like that one. And uh, hopefully that happens later that year so we can, you know, salvage what we've got left, left of this thing. John? Peter B. have looked good. Um, what he, 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 looked, he did what he does when he looks good, which is he's got boxing skill and he's got amateur pedigree. But, but when he thinks he's too much of a slick boxer is, is when he tends to lay back too much and, and let somebody hang around that shouldn't and he doesn't look as good. He wasn't doing that Saturday night, and I've seen him like that before, like when he fought Campillo uh, on NBC when PBC was first uh, getting started. I mean, that, that, I've said it before. I'll say it again because I saw it again Saturday night. When, when, he, when he comes forward and he's really coming after you, and then he, and he's using his skills in that way with the power he's got, he throws some combinations to like Tyson. I mean uh, – it, you know, the power in both hands, in other words, you know, where he's throwing in a combination and, and all the shots are big. And that's what he was doing Saturday night against Kalajic. And uh, I thought the stoppage could have been a little quick. I don't think the result was going to be any different. But, you know, I saw that stoppage in the Anthony Young, Sodom Ali stoppage on the Canelo card. And I am not. I don't think either result was going to be different. But if, if we're going to be getting stop, fights stopped that quick, I mean, I don't want anybody getting permanently injured, but – but this is professional boxing, and you know we're, we, we've got enough troubles with viewers to the sport as it is. I, I think you got to watch that. I mean, those those stoppages were a little bit premature, I think, for for what you'd like to see. But but Peter Briev looked really good when he fights like that. He's he's a threat to beat any of the other light heavyweights, even though it's one of the strongest divisions in boxing. So uh, he's 34, though. I think really he's got to do it in the next year. I mean, the, the clock is. The clock is running out. He, I don't know if he's going to get the fights he needs, but he, 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 needs him to, he needs him in the next 12 months. All right. You want to go ahead and look ahead to the fights this week? We'll start off with the ESPN card. We have Emmanuel Navarrete against Isaac Dogbo, John. Actually a good fight. Uh, the odds have been interesting in this one because, uh, to me, a head-scratcher for, for a, a few moments Dog Bay opened up as a favorite, and then it quickly changed around. Now, now that, you know, more states have legal sports betting, uh, you know, of course, we've got the MyBookie AG, and it for, for uh, you know, people will always have that available to them, and then other states now have illegal, and they've got mobile apps. You know, I, I've noticed that sites that are actually taking money, you're going to see different odds sometimes than you see just thrown around on the Internet. And I don't see any the sites that are actually taking money with Dog Bay as any kind of favorite. They've got Navarrete as as a slight favorite, but clearly a favorite. So that makes more sense to me. Uh, I kind of want to see a fight for a second time. you got to think, could somebody adjust? How did the first fight play out? One of, one, one of the tests I've been using in recent years that has been pretty good is, you know, did something turn in the second half of the first fight that could carry over to the next fight where maybe you would get a different result? That was not the case in this Navarrete Dog Bay fight. I thought Navarrete was about to stop Dog Bay at the end of the second, at the end of the first fight. He was just beating him up in the whole second half of it. So what I'm saying is, I saw no trending in the first fight. Like for example, in a Kovalev Ward one, you saw even though I thought Kovalev won that fight, you saw Ward take over the whole second half of the fight. So you saw something that might happen the next time around, and and it did. Um, I don't see any. I didn't see anything Dog Bay was doing in the first fight, or that he could adjust. That's going to turn it around. I think Navarrete's five seven. Dog Bay's five two. You know, you you got to work yourself 
inside like a Joe Frazier when uh, you got that kind of size disadvantage, even at 122 pounds. And there's just not many guys today that can do that. Dog Bay is good as a pressure fighter, but I, I don't think he can do it against Navarrete, what I saw in the first fight. Might be close for a while, but I, I just I just think Navarrete is going to get the same result as not. All right, Jeremiah. I agree. I mean, it just seems like Navarrete has his number. I mean, it, you know, he seemed pretty confident in there. He was using his size well. Dog Bay looked, uh, you know, discouraged pretty quickly, you know. And uh, I think just like John said, I mean, I don't see any stylistic adjustments that Dog Bay can make. I mean, he is a damn good fighter. And funny enough, a lot of people, you know, favored him. I mean, uh, you know, he, he was kind of seen as, you know, this was just one of those fights, you know, kind of a – I don't want to say a stay-busy fight. I mean, it, it was seen as a good fight, but, you know, nothing that he shouldn't be able to overcome. And then he just he got dominated, in my opinion. I mean, it, it's just one of those fights, like, uh, you know, it, he used his size, and, and Dante just didn't look like – he didn't look like he could be slick enough to work his way inside if, if he needed to. I mean, he was just getting outboxed from the outside. He was trying to do what he can there. And he looked to be in, in kind of survival mode until, you know, the, the, the final gong sounded. So – I think Navarrete gets him. I think he stops him this time. Uh, I think he does much of what he did the first time, but, you know, with more confidence and, you know, lands harder shots. And, yeah, it's a matter there, I, I would say, in the mid rounds. All right. We got Miguel Burchell against Francisco Vargas, Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is uh, Vargas to me looks shot. Uh, he's, he's not looked good. He seems like one of those guys who. His body really doesn't take well to beatings, and he just faded quickly. I mean, remember some of you know some of the fights he was in beforehand. You know, before he he got beat by Burchell. This is a rematch, right? I'm not mistaken here. Um, yes. Yeah, it, it, I mean, he got beat up in in the first fight by Burchell. Uh, you know, technically Vargas is still ranked in the top ten, uh, 130. I mean, he's not a bad fighter, but there just hasn't been much going on in the weight class. Uh, even the top dogs like Burchelt and uh, uh, Trevante Davis haven't really been fighting elite level opposition, and this just feels like an unnecessary rematch to me. I mean, I would have much rather seen, you know, Trevante Davis and you know Miguel Burchelt go at it. This just seems unnecessary. Again, I, I I saw what happened in the first fight. Vargas does not have the stuff to beat him this time. In fact, Burchelt is probably better, and Vargas is probably worse than you know what they were in the first fight. So I, just, I see a quick stoppage. I'm not saying a round or two, but I just don't see this going very far. All right, John. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm terming this one. Uh, of course, boxing is a, a, a pretty brutal sport, as we know. I, I, I can't help but term this one as an action massacre because I'm going to watch it because I think there's going to be some action as, as long as it goes, which I'm with Jeremiah. I don't think it will maybe be very long i think burke kelp was given a beating given him a beating the first fight and i thought he could have stopped him a lot easier and earlier uh and i'm with jeremiah all the way i think vargas is completely shot and i think one of the reasons is yeah he takes the beatings but unlike a lot of uh, mexican fighters which were used to coming up younger and early um vargas was an amateur for a while you know in in mexico and and he, he didn't really kind of crack into the, the top 10 rate, legit top 10 radar screen. So he was at a relatively advanced age for 130 pounder. So, you know, he, he got that all action style where he takes beatings along the way too. You know, we, we remember the Miura fight, which was a great fight, which he really got battered all over the place before he had to get off the canvas to win. And, and you know, he's had a lot of fights like that. I, I, I think he's totally shot like Jeremiah does. Uh, I don't think this fight does need to happen. I, you know, um, Vargas has got the right to make his own decision, but but I don't think this is a good idea. This fight, um, but because of the action factor of it, um, you know, Burkelt is a huge favorite, which he should be. Uh, I, I don't. I think some people who just don't think or are, are looking at this fight wrong. This is just a massacre. But but there'll be action as long as it lasts. But uh, I, I see a, a beating uh, in store for Vargas, and hopefully he doesn't get hurt. All right, and then, <clears throat> John, I know you like the Fox card. You think it's the best one of the weekend, which doesn't take much to do. We'll start off with Matt Korobov versus Emmanuel 
Aleem. Yeah, Mike, I, I actually think when you consider that that the two best bouts on this card, the two featured bouts, involve 154 and 160 pound guys, which is a good all around blend of skills and power, you know, weight. I think you can make an argument going in that, and again, I'm with you. It's not saying much at all this year, but this might even, when you take a two fight card, we've sunk to the point where this, to me, is arguably the best two fight card of the year so far. Arguably. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to say about the the, uh, the super fly of the sore rung V-side with the Estrada and then the 122-pound guys, Roman and, and uh, you know, uh, Daniel Roman and Doheny. But, you know, th- th- those, again, r- reality is reality. With what that the right there tells you how there. bad this year has been, John. Right. That, that's lower weights, and those fights were, were good. But I, I think this can be better. To me, Jarrett Hurd's one of the most underrated guys in boxing at this point. Uh, so, again, starting off with Aleem and Korobev, Aleem's been an all-action guy who has boxing skill. He's not a, a unskilled brawler. He's got a weird package like that where he's got boxing skills, but he's the rare boxer who likes to stand and trade, which is good for actions, and he throws a lot of punches. He, he's not, he has some power, but he's not a huge banger. Korobev ball the same way in the sense that he boxes – uh, a, a little more, not recklessly, but you know, he'll, he'll get in some decent fights. And, and same thing, he's got power, but he's not a, a massive banger. But both guys have been stopped before. Uh, you know, Korobov by Andy Lee and uh, Aleem by the one punch by Santano. Um, odds makers have it close. They've got Korobov a slight favorite. I like the fight a lot. I think it's got a, a lot of uh, action potential with these two guys. It's a, it's a pretty good style matchup. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's a very, very tough one to call. I, I don't feel strongly about it. I'm thinking maybe Aleem's got a chance for an upset here, but but he did suffer a brutal knockout at the hands of Centeno, and you never know how the punch resistance is going to respond after something like that. So I think either guy could get knocked out, too, in this fight. I mean, a lot of things, different things could happen. It makes it intriguing. Very, very tough one to call. Korobov coming off a good performance against uh, Jamal Charlo. But, you know, Korobov's in his mid-30s now, and, and he didn't he boxed very well, but he didn't throw a ton of punches in that fight. And, and Aline will let his hands go. So I like the fight a lot. I hope it's just going to be good. Uh, I'm thinking Aline's got a shot at enough up, upset, but I don't feel strongly about it at all. All right, Jeremiah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I feel the same way. I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Cora Bob's a good fighter. I've always liked him. I mean, he, he's been one of those guys that I had hoped got a, got a chance a, a while before. He was just kind of lingering around and inactive for, you know, a while. And I always felt he had the skills to get it done. And it looked as if he might do so against Andy Lee, uh, you know, in some, you know, trinket shot. But, you know, he ended up getting stopped there. But this is good. Aleem is a live body. Cora Bob is good. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say what exactly Korobov is, is going to do after this fight, but he seems motivated and rejuvenated after the, the close fight with Charlo. And, uh, yeah, I think he gets it done here. I'm just I'm trying to figure out where he fits in. Uh, you know, he he's, seems like a PBC guy, so it's, uh, you know, again, it's just, just kind of hard to figure out where exactly he goes in the future because the division is so good anymore that, uh, you know, it's hard to see him. I, I, his His – Idea is probably that he wants, uh, you know, a shot at some trinkets. But again, I'm just I'm trying to figure out where exactly he fits in. There's just so many guys, so many moving parts right now, and I'm just not sure. All right, main event: <clears throat> Julian Williams against Jared Hurd. Do you think Williams has how much of a shot? Do you think Williams has Jeremiah? I mean, I think he has. <sighs> I don't know. I mean, he's got a shot. You know, it seems like everybody's got a shot. I mean, Jarrett Hurt is a damn good fighter, and I think he's the best at 154 right now. But it's not. he's not – you know, I don't see him as some immovable object. I mean, he was outboxed by Tony Harrison, you know, for a large portion of their fight. Uh, you know, guys who stick and move can give him issues, and Williams can do a little bit of that. But it just seems as if eventually, like most of these guys, uh, he's going to get caught, and he's going to get broken down, and he's probably going to get stopped. But he is a good boxer. I mean, you know, he was 
he wasn't that outgunned against Charlo. You know, he's got good amateur experience. He's a solid guy, you know, no real big technical flaws. Um, but again, I think he's going to be competitive early. You know, he's going to stick with the jab. He's going to try to use, use some lateral movement. But I just think, you know, I think Jared Hurd catches him, takes over the second half of the fight, and gets him out of there before the final bell sounds. All right. Do you agree, John? Because this is actually pretty close on the odds because Julian Williams is a plus 400. That's about as close as it gets nowadays. Oh, yeah, the way it goes nowadays, Mike, that's the thing. You're right. I mean, hey, and to prove how Star- good this card is, Isaac Dogba is only plus 180. So he's only like a – you got a 2-1 to one and a 4-1 to one underdog here. Those are com- highly competitive fights nowadays. Well, well Dogba is on the ESPN card, but on this one you got Cora Bev and Aleem, and that's close enough no, too. I'm just I think. telling you, there's two fights here that are under plus 500. That doesn't happen very oh, often. Definitely, Matt. I mean, the – the Aleem Korobev is close to even money, but Korobev is the favorite. I mean, he's like a he's like a minus two hundred or something like that. But uh, you know, hey, again, that's for nowadays. Yeah, they don't have I mean, Korobev on and Aleem on this one. So the one I, I the, some of them have him up there. The ones the ones that does have him up there, they got him like a Korobev, like a minus two hundred or something. Yeah, minus two hundred. So it's it's close. But yeah, Hurd and Williams. I mean, it's tightened up a little. There is some money going on to Williams. Um, you know, I have, I think Jarrett Hurd is a threat, and, and this includes what I saw even Saturday night. Even though Canelo showed a lot of good things, and he's going to be tough to beat for anyone, I, I think Hurd's a threat to beat anybody at 154 or 160 right now. Um, I think what makes this fight intriguing, it wouldn't be as intriguing, but the one thing that still adds some intrigue to this fight is Julian Williams looks so good against Nate Gallimore, and Nate Gallimore had been on a roll uh, got himself into the ring and the transnational rankings, so legitimate rankings, not alphabet stuff. And and he was really on a roll. He he blew away Justin Deloach when D- Justin Deloach was on that winning KO streak, and uh, he he had some other good fights. He was he was punching hard, and Williams made him look like an amateur. I mean, he just made him look like a guy that didn't know how to fight, um, and just beat him up basically. Barely went the distance, so. That, that, that's the thing I'm saying, well, I wouldn't be giving Julian Williams any shot, but he had that performance against Gallimore, who's a strong guy. Um, but I don't think he can do it against Hurd. I just think Hurd can do too many things. But Julian Williams will box and let his hands go. So I think while it lasts, it should be pretty entertaining because Jarrett Hurd will come after you. Uh, and, and I think he'll come after Williams. And, you know, it's going to be interesting really to see can, can Hurd get him out of there uh, earlier or in a fashion that uh, Jamal Charlo did, and I think that he can. And uh, but Julian Williams is is just a talented, good enough fighter that you know he he's not some chump in there that's just going to be laying down or has no skills. So he'll he'll probably box him for a while, like Jeremiah said. And and while he's boxing him, uh, that might give Jarrett Hurd some trouble and be interesting. But but Hurd Hurd should should get to him and and uh, take him out of there and. Uh, you know, I think Jarrett Hurd's a future star. I'm just hoping for boxing that this card, since it's good, gets some ratings on Saturday night, 8 o'clock on Fox. I'd like to see at least $2 million. I, I think overall boxing viewership per event is, is way down, no matter what the platform is. I think we all got to look at that, and I think we do here on this show, but that's a reality. So with everything kind of down – I'm thinking if PBC with this card Saturday night on broadcast Fox can can they at least approach two million, maybe scrape two million? That wouldn't be bad for where we're at, and, and maybe boxing can start slowly crawling out of this hole at least a little bit. Not till they give us better fights than this, John <laughs> or Jeremiah. Anything else you want to talk about tonight? Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to mention something that I, I find a bit odd, too. I mean, I saw some people complaining about this, and I, I don't know, maybe you guys can help me understand, but I saw a few people who were upset by the WBC's decision to let Vasil Lomachenko fight Luke Campbell for the you know their trinkets. Uh, you know, some of the complaints were, hey, you know, Lomachenko was unranked by the WBC, doesn't seem fair, uh, Honestly, who gives a shit? I mean, if you want, right. if we're really going. I mean, if we're really following, I mean, so uh, the, the top ranked guy besides uh, Luke Campbell is some Russian guy. I can't even remember his name right now. 
Okay, so they were going to circumvent his, you know, this Russian's number two ranking to put in Devin Haney. Okay, so so there's that, and now they're, you know, the Bob Ryan or uh, Bob Arum was able to get Vasil Lomachenko into the pole position to fight Campbell for it. And it just seems odd to me that you would complain about the best lightweight in the world losing out on a, on a getting a title shot because he's unranked. I mean, what, what do we even have titles for? I mean, do we, do we just want, you know, Luke Campbell to fight some Russian guy that, you know, no, none of us even know and that, you know, it's probably a setup fight anyways to get him the title. I mean, we know how much of this works anyways. It's just a bunch of political maneuvering. And Eddie Hearn, after hearing the news that, you know, Lomachenko was in fact going to get that, he was like, hey, you know, I'm disappointed in the decision. Well, of course he was because he had just signed Devin Haney and wanted his two lightweights to vie for that trinket. Okay, so that money would have then been in-house. So he got outplayed by Bob Arum, and now there's some I, – I don't understand. I mean, these things – you know, whenever you're fighting for a title, it should be the best versus the best. And Lomachenko versus Campbell is much closer to that than Campbell versus Haney. I mean, Haney very well might be better than Luke Campbell. It's possible. But Campbell is obviously more proven. He's obviously higher in the rankings. So I just don't get it. It's like, okay, Lomachenko is not ranked. So what? I mean, he's the best in the world. He deserves a shot more than anybody. I mean, and it's, it's, a, it's a silly fucking Wait a second. Anyways. Wait a second. Vasil Lomachenko is the lightweight champion of the world. Why does he deserve a shot at anything? He's the champion. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's not really the champion. Yes, he is. He is I mean, really the champion, Jeremiah. I, I hate to tell you yeah. this, but... I don't believe for a second that Luke Campbell's the lightweight champion of the world, even if he beats whoever. This is well, my stupid problem. to even talk about because you could only have one world champion. Right. That's my well. That's my thing. Well, my problem is, is Lomachenko is not being given the chance at being you know the champion of the world, and uh, you know part of that is because Mikey Garcia is uh, you know is is choice to get rid of the title you know so that's a bit unfortunate but yeah it's, it's just it's, it just seems a bit odd to me that people and i'm talking hardcore boxing fans are getting upset by this it, it just makes no sense to me i mean what do you what do you want you want you know luke campbell to fight this this russian guy and then you know take a, a, vol, a, a voluntary defense where he's beating somebody even worse and then he, you know, he finally steps up and takes on somebody. I, I just don't understand the, the game, and it's like people are getting too deep in all this political stuff. Yeah, the, I, they're too. It, there's just it disgusts me because I mean I'm disgusted at the same people, but you know maybe not for different reasons, slightly different reasons. I mean I, I'm looking at it in a way like Mike is. I mean Lomachenko's the ring champ, even if you don't think he should be the ring champ. He's clearly the number one lightweight in the world. To me, Luke Campbell is just Lomachenko Krola too. I mean, we, we just now, hold on. Luke Campbell's uh, better than Krola. Not not by much. It doesn't matter. Much. He's better. Uh, uh, he's not much. Better. Luke Campbell I mean, won't lay need, down. You know, How about that? We, these guys are these guys are fighting twice a year. You know, we don't have time because of an alphabet belt. Uh, for Lomachenko Campbell. And, and that's what they want to feed us. And then they're using the alphabet belt as the cover. That's, that's the problem with it for me. And then, but I'm with Jeremiah that, you know, it's these same fans and, and, and like who, if let's say then it wasn't Lomachenko Campbell, it was Campbell Haney or something. And this is what you're getting at, Mike, would, would think that Campbell was some kind of a world title holder, you know, if he won that fight. It, it's yeah. ridiculous with Lomachenko out there. So, you know, it's just it's just silly. It's people focused on the wrong things. You know, you know what we need more is focusing on something like Lomachenko is the number one lightweight in the world right now. He need I would even say most intriguing because, you know, to me, if you're you're trying to split hairs between a Luke Campbell and a Teofimo Lopez, Luke Campbell can't punch. Okay, so that that makes it even less intriguing because. I want somebody in with Lomachenko that Lomachenko's got to worry about getting hit by. 
even though he's he's a great defensive fighter. Even a even a Richard Comey gives me that. I don't get that from a Luke Campbell. I don't want to see that fight. That fight has no intrigue for me. It's basically a replay. Oh, of I would be thing. fine with and, Comey and Lomachenko. I would too. I would too because Comey's strong. He's going to come forward and he's got some pop. Tiafimo Lopez has got speed, talent, and pop. I, those fights give me some intrigue. We know this is not happening with the promotional stuff, but if Gervonta Davis was up at lightweight, that's got intrigue for me. There, there's, but even even with the easier to make fights, Comey and Lopez, there's more intrigue out there. I don't want the rest of the year wasted for Lomachenko on Luke Campbell and Cro- I mean, his year is going to be Luke Campbell and Prola. That's the problem with boxing. As good as even Lomachenko is, that's the problem with boxing right there. His 2019 is going to be Krola and Luke Campbell. Come on. Yeah, but unfortunately, fans are fine with that because now it right. seems like more and more when you look on social media that it's more important to be one of four champions than it is to be one champion. Right. All, yeah, know, know. The alphabet belt, yeah, they can't get beyond it. Yeah, that's that's the leverage Demetrius Andrade has, right? I mean, he, you know, uh, uh, Alvarez is talking about being, you know, "Quote unquote undisputed," uh, you know. He wants all four trinkets. Listen, Andre is a damn good fighter. I, I'm not going to deny that he's a legitimate top ten guy. The problem, however, is we already know what's that, what's going to happen. And Andrade, Andre has even he's hinted at this himself. He's uh, you know just go to boxing scene. He's like, well, I'm going to I'm going to keep my jab in um, Alvarez's face all night. Well, yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to try to stick and move the whole damn time. Right. You're going to you're going to give us a dud. And to be honest with you, I don't find Andrade as impressive as I found Erislandi Lara. I, I think Lara is clearly the superior operator. I mean, at this point, I don't think there's much to choose between them, and Lara is clearly past it. You know, Andrade so, has done nothing to deserve an opportunity. No. Well, yeah. I, again, like you said, it's just it's just a stupid alphabet trinket. You know, they're using as leverage, and uh, like John said, who we, you know, they, who we won the alphabet. I think of who we won the alphabet trinket from. Yeah, who was that? Like Arkov or something like that. That Akikov, that Akikov guy who is is on the on this level does not fight very well. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. I mean, so I would much rather see a, a Billy Joe Saunders fight against. Uh, against Canelo Alvarez and you know Demetrius Andrade, and that's what they should be focusing on. But this is, like you guys said, it's a lot of hand waving. I mean, When's the last time magicians, Billy Joe you know? Saunders fought? <laughs> he's uh, fighting some no what hope for coming up. He's fighting Shefat, yeah. but who has he fought last? It was, uh, I think it was that light heavyweight against some no namer. <laughs> yeah. So oh, my point is this: Billy Joe Saunders. I hate to tell the British people this, is shit. Because if he was any good, he wouldn't have had to go life and death with Chris Eubank Jr. He beat a one-dimensional David Lemieux. He does not belong in the ring with Canelo Alvarez. And I know his style would give Alvarez trouble until Alvarez knocks him unconscious in about the sixth round. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I think you're being a little hard on him. No, he's soft. He's a little bitch. He doesn't fight. He spends most of his time <laughs> snorting cocaine. You're not going to tell you. You know, Canelo, the only illegal substance he did was to make him a better fighter, not a worse one. <laughs> yeah, he's not, he's not driving around the U.K., you know, uh, making fun of hookers and stuff. He, he actually seems like he's That's kind of my point. Bit, uh... Billy Joel Saunders, to me, <laughs> is not a guy I take seriously. I mean, I, I just yeah, don't. Because he doesn't take himself seriously. Exactly. So why should I take seriously him fighting Canelo Alvarez? I don't think Canelo Alvarez is an all-time great fighter, but I think he's one of the top two or three fighters there is today. And I watched him go life and death with Gennady Golovkin. Billy Joel Saunders could not stand in front of Gennady Golovkin and even be in the fight after six or seven rounds. You know, I have yeah, issues with Canelo, the all-time great thing. I haven't seen too many all-time greats that weren't killers. He was a killer when he had to be, when he was forced to be against Golovkin. I just want to see that all the time. If he could do that all the time, 
I would call him all time great because I think his level of boxing skill is very few guys in the last ten years can go can do what he could do. I just want to see somebody, and I, I hate to bring this up, Sugar Ray Leonard. You know, he beaten up Larry Bonds tenth round. He just didn't coast through fifteen. He took Bonds' head off. You know, that's what I want to see Canelo do. That's what we miss with the fighters that we have today. I mean, even if you if you look at the heavyweights and the reason these heavyweights will never be like the nineties, because none of them want to get in a damn fight. Deontay Wilder is looking to throw one shot to knock somebody out. Tyson Fury is trying to keep from getting hit. I'm, I'm I don't want to watch that shit. I want to watch guys that want to go out and figure out who's better, not who can do a little bit more than the other guy to win. Yeah, yeah, it's like we we talked about before, and I, I don't think I don't know if we mentioned this on air, but. It's like, you, you know, you put Sugar Ray Leonard against Floyd Mayweather's competition at 147, and the difference <laughs> is, you, yeah. you, think Floyd, you think Sugar Ray Leonard's going 12 rounds with Carlos Baldemir. He ain't he's going, going three rounds, rounds with Carlos Baldemir. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you think Bert, Berto's seeing the, you know, the final bell. Do you think, Berto ain't uh, seeing uh, round Robert, five. <laughs> Robert Guerrero. I mean, it, come on, man. It's just, it, it's a different breed of fighter. I mean, and unfortunately it is, it is because... These guys, they just have so much. We, this is why. I mean, remember when we talked to Abel Sanchez, Mike, and Abel said he doesn't even train American fighters because of their their entitlement mentality. You know, and, and you see it all the time. I mean, it, it plays out in the ring, and when you combine that with the amateur system, with te- which teaches you to touch guys and then get away, it, it's it's just breeding fighters like this, and that's why we constantly got to deal with matchups like that. That's why he sticks to the Eastern European guys. It's like, well, you know, they, they seem to take it seriously. They don't take it for granted. You know, they're crossing an ocean to get here. But, yeah, we're, we're going to see a lot more of this stuff because of it. I'd much want to rush a Russian or a Chechnyan fight. I don't know. I think i think I got to disagree a bit in that I, the amateur was a problem, but they're starting to change some of the system. I, I see some of I see, them. I see – a crop of Americans now coming up that can punch, that have some skills, but they're actually not being brought along fast enough. That's what I see. I, I, I'm seeing some promise, but I'm just seeing guys getting put in with no hoper after no hoper and years going by and move these guys. Let's go. I mean, you know, make some fights. I, I mean, I don't know what – really, I don't even know what these promoters are waiting for at this point. It's always supposedly marinating – but the promoters are doing the same nowhere. thing the fighters do when they're trying to do just enough to get by. The promoters are just trying to keep their cash cow going so they can keep making money off of him. And the fighters are trying to do just enough to get by. Everybody here is trying to do enough to get by. Nobody's trying to be great. Nobody's trying to break the bank, really. Because if you wanted to break the bank, Spence and Crawford could break the bank. Especially next September... If you've got a Pacquiao or Thurman fight and a Porter fight on regular TV, I mean, that fight could break the bank. But they don't even want that. Uh, I, I think the, the, the viewership trending is not going in the right direction for all platforms right now. But I think I can see the handwriting on the wall. Some people might not like it. I don't mind it because I think if it works, there'll be some at least increased interest. And it's not going to be every fight the absolute best, but I think PBC is setting up for a last hurrah here. Where, in other words, you're going to have you're going to have Thurman Pacquiao on pay per view July 20th. You're going to have Spence Porter for free. After Wilder, you know, if he doesn't stumble against Brazil and takes him out, I think he'll be fighting Kanatsky and Ortiz in the rematch. And like it or not, one of those fights might be on Fox. Maybe one's a Showtime or a pay per view. His numbers are going to start accumulating in terms of viewers. Again, he's got to get by Brazil. And what I'm just kind of looking at is we'll see at the end of 2019 if all those fights happen, which I think those fights probably are going to happen. You know, we'll see what the interest in the viewership is. And, and maybe it turns out I'm wrong. It's just it's hopeless and it's not there. But this is going to be it to me because I just don't think the zone reaches enough people. I think top ranks ESPN fights just haven't been good enough, and then too many go to ESPN Plus, which just doesn't have the viewership. Showtime's numbers are down. Um, I just, 
you know, I think that's just what we're, we're dealing with. Yeah, I think we're screwed. <laughs> I do. I mean, this is the way this has been going for the last decade, and it continues to get worse. And basically, the sad thing is on social media, about the only posts you see are, you know, who's afraid, Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, or Tyson Fury. And none of them are afraid. It's just they won't let them fight. They won't demand to fight. Right. It's all a big freaking joke. I mean, Spence and Crawford. Crawford's yelling to fight Spence because, let's face it, you know, Spence has options. Crawford doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> If this was the opposite way around, John, it would be Errol Spence screaming for a Crawford fight, and Crawford be ah, just hold right. on a minute. Right, and and I agree. I'm not. I'm, I'm I'm beyond the. I'm beyond the blaming Wilder, Joshua Fury part. I don't like it. I mean, I want. I want. Yeah, I don't think it's that, really you know, got anything to do with yeah. any of those three. No, nah, it's just they're going to do what they're going to do on their separate tracks, and I don't think they're afraid of each other. Um, heck, Wilder and Fury fought already, and I don't think Joshua was afraid either. Um, but they're not going to fight. They're not fighting this year. I'll say that one. Heck, I, I usually try to. Yeah, usually the, try the to only be people afraid here are, are the people that back them because if they lose. But I can tell you right. this: it's not like the three of them are Ali Foreman and Joe Lewis. So I, I would say, if a year from now, if we're still sitting here, at least one of them's lost, maybe two of them. And it wouldn't shock me if all three of them have. It's not impossible. Hey, it's boxing. It's heavyweight boxing. It's not impossible. I mean, I think Wilder, in a weird way, I don't mean that he's they're taking the fight for this reason, but I think because Joshua, and I've been consistent with this, I think because Joshua dominated Brazil so much, whatever you think of Brazil, I think that was Joshua's best performance. I think very little think of Brazil. So just and, and, and you know, a lot of people do, but I'm just saying, I think that was, to me, was Joshua's best performance. I think if Wilder stumbles to this guy, this particular guy, it's a disaster. So, in other words, I think that there's a risk there um, that he really will mess himself up much worse than other situations. Like, if he, if he lost to Ortiz in, the sec, in, a, in a rematch or Kanatsky, it's not good for him, but they can have a good rematch and make yeah. some money. Yeah, but I That's think this. I, I think as, as soon as Wilder loses, I think he's done. Like I said, I think, you know, if, if, if with, with Ortiz, Konatsky, I'm not saying he's going to lose, but you could, you could have some pretty good selling rematches in the U.S. if he lost. Well, I, I don't think there's any way he loses to Ortiz now. I think Ortiz is done. I think he was damn near done the first time because, I don't know, if Ortiz, well, come on, he turned down like 5 or $6 million for a shot at Joshua. I know That's he's rumor, waiting for the Wilder fight, but I don't think it's a rumor because I haven't heard anybody say anything less than $5 million from people that are in the know, and then he asked for $10 million. So he's waiting on the Wilder fight. Now, I think what that means is it's pretty obvious. He thinks he has a better shot against Wilder than he does Joshua. Yeah, I or, said or who knows what? Well, they might so. be offering him for the Wilder fight might be a lot of money. I doubt it. Well, I don't also, know how you could offer uh, him a lot of money. You can't offer him $10 million to fight Wilder. Well, you can, but you're going to lose your ass. But they do that all the time now anyway, so what the hell. Well, you know, it depends on the sequence, though, because PBC, again, the numbers overall were down. It's starting to concern me. But let's say numbers even are mediocre, but, but think of how bad the other platforms are doing, like, like something like this. Like, and this will be totally realistic. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it could happen. Let's say Wilder, and this is based on his recent trends, he does a million for Brazil on May 18th, so a million people see him on Showtime. Then let's say he fights Kanatsky on Fox. Kanatsky's going to fight Ariola now on the Spence Porter card, so Ariola, he's going to get seen by a lot of people. People are getting to know Wilder more and more. I mean, if Wilder and Kanatsky fight on Fox in the fall on the right night, they might get seen by a few million people. Yeah. Um, what, you know, that, what the, night are they going to fight on in the fall? Well, that's the thing. they got to watch what football they're going yeah, on. Yeah, so, so, I mean, that could be a killer right there. And the other thing is this. I don't think beating a fat Polish guy is really going to inspire people. <laughs> I well, mean, it, it, they it, just it, need to fight seen. each other. Get, I mean, this it, fight, it's, it's get, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's enough 
people left for Joshua Wilder and Fury to fight where they can make it any bigger. I mean, Dominic Brazil, freaking Tom Schwartz, and Andy Ruiz. Well, yeah. I mean, look at the look at the top ten. I mean, uh, I mean, who constitutes the top ten? I mean, uh, Ortiz already been beaten. Povetkin already been beaten. Brazil already been beaten. Ruiz already been beaten by somebody. Uh, Joshua already beat. Uh, Brazil already. Uh, I said him already. Already been beaten. I mean, is there somebody in the top ten? Who am I missing? Who's in the top ten who hasn't been beaten so far? I mean, Parker's still in there. Dillian White Konatsky. already got beat. Konatsky. Konatsky. So it, it's like Konatsky is about the only guy in the top ten who hasn't been beaten by one of these guys. I mean, and that, Konatsky's that the only you. guy I want to see fight one of these guys just because he hasn't been. Exactly. I don't know yet. Well, I agree. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm there with you too, but this is – that's my problem is you look at the landscape and just about already – just all, all, all of these guys have pretty much lost already. I mean, unless you have, uh, you know, Oscar Rivas in your top ten, which I think is I think is plausible given his performance over – you know, his late stoppage over Jennings. He's a pretty good fighter. Uh, you know, so maybe Rivas and maybe Konaski. Maybe I'm missing somebody else. But those are about the only two names so far who haven't been beaten in the top ten. I mean, this is – to me, that indicates that these guys should have already been getting it on. I mean, hey, what about Kubra you know, Pulov? Oh yeah, no, that, that's that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. that is, that's one. Arab, but stop. Arab could argue yeah, that. But, yeah. Darrell Miller's yeah, only that, been that beaten is, by drug tests so far, but drug tests are the only thing he's fought. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, I figure he's no, he's nobody's top ten anymore because of that, anyways. But yeah, Kubra Pulov. He seems to be all right. But hey, put it like this. You know who's still ranked 18th by BoxRec? Who? Tomas Adamek. Those BoxRec well, ratings are hard. I know. Robert Hellenius is number 21. And they got yeah, Carlos Takam, number 25. The, Does anybody here and, and think I, Thomas Adamek could beat Carlos Takam? No. No. Not at, no, not at this point. But uh, yeah. although I don't know, I don't know. He can't. <laughs> hey, well, what do you guys? What do you guys think of again? It, it's not good for his health, and and nobody's going to pick him to win. But in Let's terms go. of entertainment value, what about Ariola and Konatsky on August third? That's a dangerous fight for Konatsky because we really don't know how <laughs> I mean, good he is. And I mean, he's going to be a. It's going to be a brawl. Let's if Ariola is in shape and he stays away from the tortillas, I think he could be dangerous here at least for four or five rounds. And we've seen Konatsky is there to be hit. Um, I like I mean, Konatsky. Ariola can punch. Ariola can punch. Yeah, he can. Well, well, Kon- go ahead. Well, Konatsky is just Konatsky is pretty much the Polish version of Chris Ariola, but a know, much younger, a, a much younger <laughs> right. Chris Ariola. I think Konaki's going to ball over him. I don't. I don't Ariola's had a, had a few close uh, matchups in recent years. I, I just don't think Ariola's any, anywhere near his best. And again, if you look, who is it? I think Fred Cassie was a guy that I think most people thought beat him. I think Konaki's going to ball over him. I mean, but you know, it is heavyweight boxing, and you never know. I, I just don't think Ariola's got anything for him at this point. What about David Price? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, you know what? If Daniel Dubois fights Joe Joyce, that may be the last. Uh, that may be the best heavyweight fighter in the next five years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now they're not going to have that. I mean, it's I just know. like that's where you just get totally frustrated. Now they're going to they were for a yeah, while, yeah. and then you got Trevor Bryan right. and Manuel Char. I mean, none of these guys have really been tested by any of the main guys. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all. Uh, it, it's all. That's that's like I said. I mean, it, it, the whole thing could just go into the tank, but. Those those PBC that PBC C scenario I'm laying out. I mean, I'm not even saying it's gonna work. I'm just saying it's about the only thing I see left where there might be some viewers. Yeah, there's not much there, and the problem is Joshua will still get viewers in England, but who's he gonna right. fight to get viewers over here? Andrew Ruiz, I don't think's gonna do it. That's on the zone. My guess is what three four hundred thousand tops. After what I just saw, I agree. And I, I thought it may be, in their defense, I thought maybe 
it would be a hair better, but not anymore because there's going to be cancellations and things yet. And so they're looking at something like that. I think Hearn made the right move that he had to, just like you said, Mike, I agree. The problem for Anthony Joshua now is not Anthony Joshua's talent. It's who's he going to fight? Who's he going to fight to get anybody in the U.S. to watch him? I mean, Andy, Re- Andy Ruiz was the best option here. The, the only option I see, see it? the only option I see is Usyk. And that's just going to be boxing Usyk, fans in this country. Right. And that's that's not, the Usyk does not Usyk does not sell in the U.S. outside of people like ourselves who talk about this stuff or, or you know, or, or watch it all the time. I mean, yeah, but no, let's face it, John. Even Joshua and Wilder, I don't know if that sells outside of people like us. Not at it a, $100. And, dollars. and it's not going to sell on get... the zone. I mean, I just, I think that they've missed a boat here. I think they let shit well, I mean, marinate too long. Well, love, see, that's the problem. And, and I, I mean this, though, that love it or hate it, that's the problem you got with the zone. Because if Joshua needs to get known in the U.S., which he does, and, and he gets seen by 400,000 people on yeah, the zone. he needs to be on and, free and, TV. Yeah, somebody's got to see him. Somebody's got to see him somewhere. And, and Wilder's going to be on there. But you're right. If Joshua doesn't get seen by anybody in the U.S., it's still not that big of a moneymaker. Yeah, because right now, oh, Wild, what... Wilder and Fury proved they're not a big moneymaker. They sold less than 300,000 pay-per-views. Maybe a little over 300,000. It, it did okay, but it's not. That, that shit, that's a heavyweight title fight, supposedly, John. It had 300,000. I, I mean, that's shit. That, well, There's that's 360 the million title. people. Yeah. It's I mean, the, it's if you believe at. in Tyson Fury, I don't. But the only thing I could see Joshua could do would be maybe fight Fury in Madison Square Garden. But the problem is, again, in the U.S., Joshua Fury doesn't. You, you, you need. Well, I think Fury need, sells as good as Deontay Wilder in the U.S. I don't think he does right now, but I think that's Aram's plan. Now, well, I think he does because Aram, Wilder doesn't sell. Wilder doesn't sell in Alabama. He's starting to – his TV numbers are starting to get good, Mike. I mean, they, they are. Dude, Christian I'm sorry. A heavyweight study, champion but... getting a million people to watch him. Is, from where I came from, that's not that many. Well, no. From, from – from, of course, it's horrible if you go back into boxing history. But, I mean, for where we're at today, for where we're at today. God, well, if, if, if 340,000 people – you know, or whatever it was, 350, I can't remember the numbers, but I thought it was around 340. For the pay-per-view, it was between 285 yeah. and 325 is what I heard, reputably. Well, the thing is, is okay, if we're, we're talking about 325,000 people seeing that on the high end, I mean, what is what, what fraction of that is the entire U.S. population? <laughs> I mean, that, those numbers are paltry. I mean, again, I, I do think, Jeez. you know, Fury does have something, and I've said this on multiple shows. I do think Fury, because of his, you know, his Irish heritage, uh, you know, you can you can always bring out people like that in New York City. I'll just say uh, it, he's white. You know, granted, that helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's well, and he's, he's, he's Irish too, you know. So it, that gives him a leg up too. You know, that's one of the that's one of the ethnic groups within the the white race. I thought that, he was a know, gypsy. Which is it, or can you be both? I don't. I don't know, man. I looked up this shit. It's like he's some Irish traveler or something. I'm not. I don't know. I mean, he just looks like an Irishman to me. So I don't know, you know, how that gypsy crap would sell over here. But <laughs> you know, in, in, in New York City, gypsy you know, you just say, hey, the dude's Irish, and he comes from a, a line of you know bare knuckle fighters, and I think you'll bring a number of people out. And, and if you put that in New York City, you're going to have a lot of Brits. Yeah, put a shamrock on too. his trunks, and you're good to go. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, and, uh, I, th- I, I think boxing so call him down, it's, it's just hard to sell anything. But I think we got to see what Aram's plan is for that. I mean, I think when Aram got the co-promotional deal, there he had some sort of plan in mind like that for Fury in the U.S. Tom Schwartz on ESPN Plus doesn't give us a good feeling about what that plan is, but I figure there's got to be some plan there. I mean, I'm not saying Fury could never be marketed in the U.S. I think he can be. But I gotta see. Aram's gotta show me a good plan there. I don't know that any of the three guys can be marketed in the U.S. anymore. It's not impossible well, that we're that far gone. I'm not saying we're not because I have been arguing that 
you know, on social media. Because, I mean, don't it's, hear it, but. this is the thing. I mean, to be marketed in this country, you have to have some sort of personality. And what we got here is we got Tyson Fury, who has a personality, but his style of fighting is not exciting. We have Deontay Wilder, who seems half illiterate when he talks, but the way he fights is exciting. And then we got Anthony Joshua, who was kind of a cross between the two of them. I mean, I think it's just boxing. I, I, I think these guys could be okay. I think they're all each okay in their own way. I think they're better than what we've had recently. But, but it's just boxing. Boxing's too far down. Well, See, it, I, I don't think either one of them are as good as either Klitschko. It's just neither Klitschko had anybody to fight. But, but and then Klitschko just didn't. You know, Klitschko never caught on over here. He just didn't. I mean, well, you know, he didn't. Um, have, yeah, but you've got to have another side to tango. You know, Ali needed Frazier. Ali needed Foreman. He needed Liston. He didn't necessarily need Carl Mildenberger. But if you have a certain style and you're blowing people away, uh, and Coach Will had the punching power, but, you know, he took those KO losses earlier on, and, and, it, and it, 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 it created a cautious style. And, uh, you know, that, that wasn't appealing. Um, well, you know, and, 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 and he, held, he held the title for a long time. Plus, he's a foreigner. No doubt that always that. hurts. It always hurts to be a foreigner. Yeah. Yeah. From a Lennox Lewis nation. didn't do bad. Lennox Lewis didn't do bad. Over yeah, but Lennox that. Lewis wasn't... wasn't a foreigner. I mean, come on. He fought for Canada in the Olympics. <laughs> That's true. He was the Canadian. Uh, he was a Canadian. Gold yeah, medal. I mean, we but don't he... consider Canadians really a different. Ca- they all speak English. You could understand what Lennox said. Lennox seemed like a nice guy. He was a great fighter. But Lennox Lewis is sellable. These guys are no Lennox Lewis. I mean, Lennox Lewis, yeah. the five men in Toronto, you can make this the three men in Madison Square Garden, and he's prime. Lennox Lewis probably knocks out all three of them within a round each. But, yeah, Lennox Lewis, you're talking, you know, heyday 20 years ago. You know, he didn't, he really didn't, I mean, he's almost an example for. He didn't know, catch he, on he here. He happened to fight Holyfield and Tyson. But, I mean, he wasn't bad. But, I mean, it wasn't that he was like a superstar or something, but it wasn't bad either. I mean, you know, he. He had attendance. He had TV numbers. You know, it was all decent, in other words. It wasn't... Yeah, but he beat Holyfield and Tyson. I mean, there's no Holyfield and Tyson here to beat. I, I, but I think boxing... I just think... I think Joshua, Fury, and Wilder are each pretty good in their own way. I think there's a lot of potential here. Now they're not fighting uh, each other, and that's bad. And boxing They all down, suck, so John. You... Jeremiah, do they suck? They just <laughs> suck. I mean, come on, Joshua may not suck, but I don't know that yet. Water, I know, sucks because he has to hit you one time in a 36-minute period so he can knock you out. Tyson Fury is boring as shit. So, to me, they suck. They all have major holes. Jeremiah? <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah's going to be a softy now and say, well, I'm not going to say they suck, but they like well, nuance. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not going to say they suck. I mean, I think they they're suck. good fighters. I mean, Whatever. Joshua so Jimmy far Young would have boxed all three of those guys' ears off. All right, all right man. We get it. I, we I think these it, guys but... are good. I think these guys are good. The division's Shit. getting better, but, but you yeah. know, you're, you're dealing with boxing. Fuck. down. Give me a just break. Down. I mean, they fought a fight where they didn't even land 100 punches, and everybody thought it was a great fight. I mean, they landed like 87 to 79 in the punches, and everybody thought we saw a great fight because somebody got knocked down twice. If you watch that fight with the sound down in the middle of the night in your lazy boy, you're going to fall asleep before the sixth round. If you yeah, watch that fight the first boy. time, then it's exciting because you never know somebody get, might get knocked out. But when you know what happened, and then you sit and you watch the fight, it's boring as shit. But I could still watch Foreman and Lyle, and that would still get me jacked up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, again, I, we talked about this during the year. I mean, we've been doing the show so long. I, you know, I thought Brazil versus Uguna was arguably better. I get, I get you know, the event wasn't as big, but, you know, in terms of sustainability. Oh, it was. They it, fought every round. That was a great yeah, fight. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, there were ebbs and flows, and it just seemed to be swept under the rug because of it. But, I mean, if, if that's fight of the year, I, I don't know. I, just, I don't think that's good for the, the vital signs of boxing either. Now, but, Canelo and Golovkin was the fight of the year last year. That was two high-level dudes getting it on. 
in a close fight. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm talking about 2017, though. Well, 2017, anyway, oh, Klitschko and Water. Yeah, yeah. Or Fury or yeah, Joshua, yeah, but, whoever the Joshua. hell it was. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, some, some guys, some guys. Just, it doesn't make a shit to me. I don't care anymore. I feel about them the same yeah. way I do to jockey divisions. Well, but this is, that's the thing, man. It's like, if you have Tyson Fury, I get that his style is not that appealing. But if you've got a big Irish guy like that, you should be able to do a lot with him in the U.S. But, again, if you put him on an ESPN Plus app, it's, a, it's like, you know, ultimately, where does it go? I mean, yeah, you're doing a little brand building, but it's not much. Well, how about I this? Mean, that, I, I don't a, buy that they're trying to build a brand. Trend. Because if they were building a brand, they would both be on network television. Or at least Tyson Fury would be on ESPN, regular but ESPN. And they would throw the Wilder on that... CBS. Yeah, no, uh, I agree with you. Tyson Fury should at least be on ESPN, at least. But if you're Bob Arum, I mean, what are your options of putting him on free TV? I mean, it, I, I don't know how that stuff works. Is there a, a way he could... You know, just by top, a time top, slot. Top or? rank, it was helpful. You know, Bruce Trampler, who's actually with top rank, it came up on Twitter, and surprisingly he answered when they were taking some heat. But it, it, it's something we needed to know. He says that top rank has no power as to whether the fight goes to ESPN or ESPN+. Plus. That in the contract, they ESPN. They don't. It's all up to and ESPN. They get to make that call. Right. And that's, that's well, obviously no, but, no, but. See, they don't no, care. They, Jeremiah, is, I don't think they want to put it on network because you could buy time and put it on the network, share revenues, what the XFL is going to do with the new Spring League next year. But they're just trying to get as many people to buy their freaking app as they can, and that's all they care about. Right, exactly. This is why, I mean, we've talked about it multiple times on this show. Don't assume that ESPN and DAZN have, you know, the long-term health of the sport necessarily in their crosshairs because – why are they putting Lomachenko and, and Crawford and some of these other big names on an app? You know, again, it's, it's to build their subscriber base. ESPN already knows the deal. They've been dealing with boxing for many, many years, right? They know it's mismanaged. They know a lot of these guys are just looking out for their own wallets and pocketbooks and stuff. But again, it, it would be it would be nice to see some you know forward thinking and you know put I don't know what to do. I mean you. Know, you put Tyson Fury on free TV, and I don't know, you, you time it with something, I don't know. But, yeah, we're not getting that. We're getting them on an app against a, a German nobody knows. Well, I don't really like to shout at German people because I'm partially German, and I know John is too, and I know John yep, probably doesn't appreciate <laughs> it either. That's what Alaska, so that's after what Alaska, your yeah. racist <laughs> comments, Jeremiah, I think it's about time to end the show. What do you think, John? Are you, are your feelings hurt too a little bit? No, I'm I, I, I'm okay, but I'd like to see Fury on regular ESPN and some decent fights. We're, we're so all. I'll end it, but we're so bad off. I'm looking at this. We're so bad off. I agree with you guys about heavyweight opponents. We're so bad off that I'm looking at this upcoming, and I'm like, there, there's going to be like a demand for Oscar Rivas if he if he beats Dillian White because there's there's no opponents out there for these guys where they're not fighting each other. Especially I for I don't think Joshua there'll be Fury. any real serious demand for Oscar Rivas though. <laughs> there shouldn't be, but there will. There might. Be. I don't think there will. I think people will just want to watch him just because they haven't seen him get his ass whipped yet. <laughs> but I mean, the promoters are going to want him. The promoters yeah. are going to want him. That's what I mean. I just want to watch Adam Konatsky against Chris Ariola in a beer drinking contest because I think that would be more entertaining. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that fight with what, we, with what we've got. Although I, I'm with Jeremiah. I think Ariola probably gets steamrolled, but. It, it might it might be some crazy entertainment for a little while. Yeah, it'll be interesting. You know, Konaski will be gushing blood in the second round, probably stop him in the third, and then Chris Ariola's going to come on and say, that's a bad motherfucker right there. <laughs> and then he's going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I cussed on TV. And then they're going to apologize <laughs> when they come back to the studio, and that's how it'll go. But anything else? This is when an hour and 20 minutes. I thought we'd be done in like 35 or 40 yeah, maybe John's got a last word because, uh, you know, I did the Campbell-Lomachenko bit. 
All right. Well, John, well, does have a last word then. John, you lost your chance for an hour and 20 minutes, and I'm ready to go to bed. Yeah, I think I, I think I, I think I even I got it all out, I guess. The point. defense rest. All right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the prosecutor or the defense usually, John? Let's see. When I haven't done criminal work for a long, long time. Uh-huh. I, I did it as a little bit of a backup thing for uh, about the first 10 years of my career, and I was on the defense side then. Okay, so you're not one of the real scumbags, probably, then. Okay, see, I told you, I'm... Jeremiah, John's all right. <laughs> yeah, we had our I'm, questions, I'm, but now, now it's not I'm, now right. I'm, I'm, for, I'm, for the, I'm for the plaintiff, I can tell you that. I am I am 100% for the plaintiff, so that's uh, on the civil side. All right, there's nothing civil about boxing, though. That's why John's here. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. Tomorrow at noon, you can hear me and Steve on Survive in Advance, where we'll talk about something. And then tomorrow, me and Bobby Sheridan will pick some stuff on the Sheridan Report. And then tomorrow night, me and Jeremiah will be back at 11 o'clock to tell you all about the impending pay-per-view beer drinking contest between Chris Ariola and Adam Konatsky. We will wrap this show up right now, and I want to remind everybody you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for John Einreinhofer, Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.